It's Emily and Clark on Sailing Vessel Temptress, and today we are driving to St. Augustine in, in some, a hurricane. In some nasty weather. Uh, this is kind of the outer bounds of Hurricane Matthew right now. We are safe. Uh, we're in a safe area, um, but we're getting some nasty weather. Hopefully this is the last hurricane of the season. Um, we're going to look forward to getting down to the Bahamas again after hurricane season is over. The reason we're going to St. Augustine today is to see our friends Rudy and Carol who also live on a sailboat. They're getting ready to head to the Bahamas for the first time. And uh, we're going to see them for two reasons. The first reason is they're going to help us get some stuff down to our boat, which we left in the Bahamas when we came back with our friend Gil aboard Stella Maris uh, this summer. Uh, things like the wind generator blade, they're too big to take on an airplane. So we're bringing some stuff to them to take down to the Bahamas and we're going to help them out too. Rudy and Carol are uh, new cruisers. Uh, Rudy's cruised before, but Carol's brand new at it. They, neither of them have been to the Bahamas. They took a shot at it last season, but found they needed to do some more work on the boat and just had a good time in the Keys. So this season, they're gonna go to the Bahamas and uh, they've got lots of questions. We're going to chat with them and talk about how to enter the Bahamas, how to do the crossing of the Gulf Stream, uh, good places to stop while you're in the Bahamas, just all those questions, provisioning, I'm sure lots of stuff will come up. If you're new to cruising or you just have questions about it, feel free to listen in on our conversation. I'm sure there's good stuff to be had. In half a mile, take exit 318 for Florida 16 towards St. Augustine at Green Cove Springs. Nothing illegal or, or you know anything anybody would ask you about in here. It's just boat spares. All right. <coughs> Show me the big bag of cocaine again. <laughs> Not a big bag of cocaine. See, it's lighter. What is it? It is cavacil. It is a uh, fumated silicon powder that you mix with epoxy to make. I got it thick. somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I use thick enough to paste. Mm -hmm. My name is Carol Miller, and this is my husband, Rudy Shippers. Hi. And we are on the SV Marinas. How long have you guys been sailing? Well, sailing, if you, if you count uh, big ships like cruise boats and freighters, I've been for a long time, probably. I've been sailing all my life, really. Just, uh, but a sailboat just since 2012. Sailboat is a little bit different than, a, than motor boats, but we, uh, it's slow and not a lot of people like it. So uh, I got lucky to meet Carol, who's been sailing since he's four years old and super likes sailing. So <laughs> for two people to survive on a sailboat, you really have to like each other. We agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> have you yeah. been cruising yet, Carol? Yes. Oh, you have. Tell us where you've been. Yeah, we um, left uh, Ruskin, Florida, which is just south of Tampa, and we um, sailed. Our first um, port was Fort Myers Beach, and then um, we stayed there for a week, and then we hopped down to Marco Island. In, in our dinghy, we took our first big trip across San Marcos Bay or whatever, yeah, to Sanibel Island. Island, and, and it was absolutely yeah, crazy. Really it was like, there were dolphins out there that stayed right there on the beach. It's uh, really pretty. Yeah. But yeah. Our, our favorite part of the whole cruise was um, we took off from Marco Island to 
uh, the dry Tortugas, and oh my gosh, have you been there yes. before? It's the it's the prettiest place I think I've ever seen, and it's <laughs> breathtaking, you know. So. This season, I can say you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Some oh, okay. from the, the Bahamas are going to be better. Oh, and if you okay. get down to like Honduras and stuff, oh my god. Wow, I'm excited. So then we came up uh, to the Keys and up the coast of Florida, and we're just we've been in like uh, like a waiting zone for you well, know waiting for the hurricane the, season to go by because we don't. The boat is technically the insurance doesn't allow the boat to go <laughs> in, in the Caribbean till after November. I told Carol taking November. taking some of your stuff with us is a. It's going to be an incentive for us to, <laughs> to make it Yeah, was there. that a trick? And, uh, well, it, it is. We tried it with is. emails to get you to like, come and it didn't work. So now we got, we're actually, we're <laughs> investing. We won't have a wind generator if you don't come. Uh, there you go. Okay. Our varnish will all fall off if we don't redo it. <laughs> See, now I feel bad. <laughs> yeah. thing, you as long as you show me the way out to get there, yeah. I'm good. We'll get you there. Rudy and Carol's first big question was, what's the best way for them to get to the Bahamas from Florida? We spent much of the rest of the afternoon going over their requirements and how they'd like to get to the Bahamas. We made a separate video on that. You can check it out on our YouTube channel. Once we had arrived at the perfect route for Rudy and Carol, we spent some time exploring St. Augustine. We took a tour of Flagler College, where Carol went to school, and also explored the fort. Then we headed back to Rudy and Carol's boat to answer some more of their questions. Okay, well, we talked about um, entering the Bahamas, and uh, one of my questions that I didn't, I wasn't clear about was, um, when we enter the Bahamas, do we have to stay at anchor or on the boat at dock, or do we like just put our flag up and then go into the customs department? When we first arrive. When we first arrive, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the procedure for entering basically any country. Uh, the legal procedure is you come in, you anchor down, you put up your Q flag, the yellow flag, um, underneath the courtesy flag, you know, whatever, but you put up your Q flag. If you see somebody with the Q flag, you're not supposed to associate with them, do any trade with them. Locals can't take, you can't take anything off the ship or anything like that. The captain and only the captain leaves the ship and goes through procedures to check in. He takes your passport and his passport and the ship's papers, goes to customs first, almost always, but you ask <clears> the port captain. Um, if they have a port captain, you go to the port captain. Bahamas doesn't. You go right to customs. Uh, customs kind of acts as the port captain that way. And then, but you go to the port captain, the port captain will say, okay, you've done this paperwork, and then they'll tell you what to do next. But eventually you're going to always go to immigrations, customs, and often back to the port captain. Okay then you're legal in the country. Now, every country also has their own. what the real thing is. They're pretty laid back in the Bahamas. Um, we don't flaunt it. Emily sat outside last time using internet and doing business while I went in and checked in and while I was doing paperwork, I think it came out once and as she read something because I didn't have my glasses or something yeah. like that. But technically I was But she to didn't be come the into boat. the room, you know, we didn't You were that. on the boat? Or? Technically I was supposed to be on the boat. Oh not okay. leaving the boat. Everyone stays on the boat. Captain goes in, does the paperwork, then right. you come back and then you're cleared and then Okay. You can come out. So but there's like a, a rule and then there's a vibe for the country. But I always really follow the rule. At least the spirit of the rule there. Okay. And then, Except and when I really need to check my email. She really needed to check her email. <laughs> I've also been anchored for a week at Gun Key before I checked in, and a guy came by one day, you know, official guy came by and said, you want to check in? I said, yeah, we'll be checking in Bimini in a day or so. Okay, fine. They're, they're just kind of nice, and I mean, if you, they kind of can tell if you're being a criminal about it or you're just, you know, um, okay. just uh, being convenient. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. United States, you wouldn't want to mess with anything. Follow every rule. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not so polite. Okay. Cool. Uh, I'd like to learn some more information about uh, the weather, the best weather situation to go to the Bahamas, or how to best prepare for it. <clears throat> yeah, we should talk about Chris Parker. Yeah, weather's like the number one question. There's a very good guy doing a very good service called Chris Parker. Um, he started out doing it over single sideband, still does it over single sideband. 
you probably get the freshest, best weather over single side band. He also now sends it out over email, and I understand that. Well, we've we've gotten that service before. It's a good service. Uh, he's will do a lot of hand holding and custom forecasts for you. It's kind of an ad for Chris Parker. Um, I've used his weather usually free because I just listened to it on a single sideband. Not just the Bahamas, but when I was down in Central America and Eastern Caribbean, I always listen to Chris Parker show as my number one. <clears throat> but the world's changing, and it's whatever you can get on your boat now. Uh, if you are going to get a Bohemian cell phone, you can just get Windfinder Pro is my personal favorite, but Windy is what you use. These mm -hmm. things all have the same kind of information. Chris is going to digest it for you better, uh, and that's probably important at your level of comfort right now to have right. him doing that yeah. but you always also want the other because then you can compare them and you start learning how to use the other based on what Chris says Chris is very conservative if Windfinder says it's going to blow like 10 to 12 he'll usually say like 12 to 15 in my experience anyway mm -hmm. his report will usually be a little bit higher than other people's and I think it's because More he realistic. just takes it seriously if somebody were to go out and then, oh my gosh, it was blowing 18. You said it was only going to blow 15. I think he's just extra conservative so that people will be prepared. are prepared, you know, so mm -hmm. there's that. Okay. Yep. But yeah, I think when I report the weather in Georgetown on the net in the morning, I compare Chris Parker first. I get his email. And then I usually check Windfinder Pro. I check the, I report the tides and things like that. And then I check something like Weather Underground that's really generic. And what I report is kind of a a mix of all three and usually it's like okay it's blowing 10 to 15 today but according to Chris Parker it's more like 14 to 17 right you know so I kind of give people both and it ends up being kind of a middle line of all those things okay for first time people going to the Bahamas who want to kind of cover their bases Chris Parker's and having something like Windfinder is a good place to start yeah at the very least it would be Chris Parker because he'll hold your hand a bit and uh, give it to you in a Bodhi way talking about waves and special concerns and something else that you could use if he's not available. So it's because like backups a backup. are nice. And right. I find when, if, as long as you can have a local internet, Windfinder is a great thing. Cool. Next okay. question. Have you ever been in a situation where you've had to go to a doctor in the Bahamas or had to seek medical attention? I haven't personally, but I got called in on a couple emergencies. Um, there's not a lot in Georgetown, but there is now a little clinic called the hospital. And uh, it's better than it used to be. Uh, the, probably the best story would be a guy who had just given me the story of that he, his birthday had gone by and he was now older than his, all of his brothers when they died and his father when he died. And they had all died of heart attacks. Oh, wow. And he was a French Canadian guy, didn't speak much English. His wife was a little better with English. And in the middle of the night, I hear this radio call, this emergency call, and I come to their boat. I had to deal with calling the police and organizing a way to get him to the airport to fly him to Nassau to, for real medical care because he was in trouble. Uh, and it was the language thing. I spoke a little French and I knew them well so mm -hmm. I could communicate with them and then I spoke English of course. So you know, I decided to move him on my dinghy because we carry a, a more substantial boat. He had an acute gallbladder attack, a really nasty, painful, mm -hmm. miserable thing that doesn't kill you. So <laughs> there was that. And, you know, he recovered from that. But he had to be flown by, like, a <clears throat> private plane. He and a nurse were flown to NASA. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of, in, like, in Georgetown, if you need to see a dentist, there's a dentist, I think it's Dr. Bazard, I think yep. is his name, and he comes, like, once a week on Thursdays or something like that. I think it's so, more like a couple days a month. Yeah, I think it's less now. And well, like a veterinarian if you needed a vet there's a there's like a SPCA humane society there and there's a vet that comes like once a month for vaccinations and things like okay. that so and there's somebody on the island that's kind of like I think she's like a vet tech or something like that mm -hmm. but those kind of specialty services it's not like they're available right away if you, you know, okay. if you have a, a filling that falls out you might have to wait a little while. Mm -hmm. um, Nassau might be a little bit different, but like where we are in Oh Georgetown, yeah, Nassau is a hospital. And yeah, Nassau is more <laughs> built up, but being on the islands, I mean, you're probably going to get, if it's something major, you're probably going to get And we're outside. talking about Grand Exuma, which is not a minor island. So if you go out to the minor islands, there's, there's kind of nothing. nothing. Yeah. You yeah. make a call on the net and you try to find someone with more medical knowledge than you have if you can't handle mm -hmm. it. Okay. Uh, that's why I've been called in more than a few times. Uh, and I'm, you know, not a doctor, but 
I prepared very heavily for cruising and, and I have a lot of the right toys on board and know how to use them. So uh, it's helped. Yeah, Clark has a medical bag and we've gotten really lucky to find doctors, you know, primary care or specialty doctors that will write us a prescription for like say, um, like antibiotics. Right. If you and had they filled the prescription every three months needed or not to build an inventory so then we have to yeah. put that in. So, okay. so if you can find the right doctor and explain, you know, I'm gonna be out in the ocean where I may not have medical care, I need you know, this such kind and of such, medicine. and they yeah. will prescribe it to you, you know, trusting that you're going to use it. Um, that's an ideal situation if you can find somebody like that. If you have some, some sort of allergy that you want to manage and you need an EpiPen or something, you probably should have some things in stock. You know, it's, yeah. it's mm -hmm. you have to be your own doctor first. We have a Here's book on board, too, called Where There Is No Doctor, which is the Peace Corps uh, mm -hmm. medical training book, which has kind of some basic information yeah. about how to recognize things, you know. Things come up, you know, you mm -hmm. might get poison ivy. There are different things. So but they, like, are there pharmacies? In There's Georgetown? pharmacies, and they really will work with you. You don't really need a prescription for anything that's not mind altering. But, like, for example, the mind codeine, they have a simple policy on codeine. They don't have any. Okay. The only painkillers yeah. they have are an NSAID, whether you go to a hospital or not. I mean, mm -hmm. you'd be right in the hospital, but not, not through the local. Lots of things you're just not going to be able to get. Drug availability, uh, something I found in this Indian pharmacy that's going to be pushing Viagra on you forever. But they have antibiotics and all kinds of stuff. And I've used some of their drugs and they were effective. So I think they're legitimate. Right. Um, and they're on the internet. I think it's, they go by about 50 different names, but it all boils down to the same organization. They, they, they go by Canadian pharmacy and U.S. pharmacy. That's um, what I like When you go to their site, if you go to like three different sites and they all look exactly the same, except for the graphics, mm -hmm. that's the outfit. Right. So I think they're, at least as of now, pushing legitimate drugs without a prescription. And I just bought a bunch of amoxicillin and erythromycin uh, to, to handle certain kinds of infections that happen that I didn't already have the right things for. I don't like to use the real broad spectrum stuff unless we need to. Also, Emily's allergic to Cipro, so I wanted to have Cipro some, some uh, um, alternatives mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So, well, we use that. So you get those filled ahead of time then? Oh, I just buy them, get them shipped to me in the United States. They okay. actually came pretty darn fast. Okay. Then I just carry them. All right. And I would rather have a dodgy drug than no drug. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if it doesn't work, well, you switch to the next drug, which is what you would do anyway with an right. infection. So it's better than nothing. Speaking of medical stuff, do you, we don't know a whole lot about it, but uh, Dan? Yeah, that's an evacuation policy mm -hmm. that's incredibly cheap. It's written around selling it to divers that go on a vacation maybe once every couple of years and then they get evacuated if something goes bad. So it comes out to be like a dollar a month. But we know somebody that had to use it and it, it did everything they said. So you get this policy and then something goes wrong and it handled the entire medevac. It, they, they came in and got him and put him on a plane and took him to a bigger plane and uh, got him to a hospital somewhere and called later on and did like concierge service because it wasn't an English speaking country. And they really, really did the job. Uh, we always say we're going to do it, but we you haven't yet. What do, you, what do you call that kind of policy? Damn. Well, it's an evacuation yeah. policy. Oh. And Dan, you know, the, the diver, the, the scuba diver thing. And you could see why it's really great for us because it's really being sold with the economics of right. you're never going to use it because you're going to take a week vacation and you won't need it. So okay. we can charge you like almost nothing a year and then it's good. But we live out there and we haven't had to be evacuated partly because we know how to deal with yeah. stuff. The food situation, what, what to do about, uh, you know, we want to maybe get some, you say fresh veggies are super expensive. Uh, what's the best way to carry, like, you know, spices? Spices. Or grow spices? Sure, yeah, that's true. That's a good thing to talk about. I wouldn't say produce is prohibitively expensive, <coughs> but by the time you buy it in the Bahamas, it's going to be less fresh. It's going to be like a package of strawberries that we pay two or three dollars for. It's probably going to be more like seven or eight dollars. Oh, so wow. it's. I mean, it's not bad. Sometimes we we buy a lot of produce when we're in Georgetown, but we don't mind paying a little more for it because we know back at the boat we've got things like pasta and rice and things that are, you know, canned food, things that are cheap to buy here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I would say 
before you go stock up on toilet paper and stock up on paper towels, things like bulky items are usually expensive down there. Another thing that we found out this year, it's really hard to find, you can't really buy like a pillow down there. So if you're somebody who likes a fresh pillow every once in a while, like go to Ikea and get one of those vacuum rolled pillows up and okay. shove it in a cupboard somewhere. Um, as far as spices go, spices are a great thing to have rather than having like those instant noodle packages or you know pre-seasoned rice and things like that you can just carry a lot of really plain staple foods and then have your spices that you can use for recipes I found that the plastic spice jars and the plastic lids let air in and then the spices go stale and lose their flavor really quickly the glass jars are better but they have those metal lids and the metal lids rust so if you are going through your spice cabinet at home and tossing out old spices, keep your spice jars because the, the winning combination is the glass jar with the plastic lid. <laughs> and they're <laughs> and interchangeable? A, they yeah, there's only so many sizes of containers that mm -hmm. they make and most often they will fit. You know, okay. whether they're the short ones or the big ones, you can kind of push, um, put them together. If you don't have a huge kitchen, and a lot of people on boats have a very small kitchen, um, I recommend going online and getting those little Ziploc baggies that you find for beads and hardware and things like that and put your spices in there. You can label them, you can alphabetize them and put them in a little box and you can get, you know, 30 spices and that big. Right. But it's also a matter of what spices do you use. You, do you yeah, need every how much spice you under you the need. sun? Yeah, we'll talk about garlic and ginger too. <laughs> <laughs> do you need every spice under the sun or do you have a few that you like? Like we use a lot of curry powder. We, we make them. Um, Curries, we make chicken salads, we use curry paste too. Mm -hmm. um, but like, what are the spices that you're actually going to use? Probably garlic, probably ginger, probably, you know, you mentioned you really like rosemary. You could grow rosemary, you could grow mm -hmm. mint, you could grow green onions. Never buy green onions at the store. You buy them one time, you stick them in the dirt, and as long as you water them a little bit, they will last forever. What do you, so do you just clip the tops of the green onions and use the tops and they just keep growing. Yeah, so okay. if you buy us the uh, thing of green onions, you'll see they still have roots on them mm -hmm. and they're white at the bottom and then they turn green and then they're darker green. Mm -hmm. So you can cut them off, leave some green, and then just stick them, space them out a little bit, put them in a pot of dirt and water them and they'll, those little tubes will actually close off and continue to grow okay. and they'll grow huge. And you don't even uh, need that much light. They're growing yeah. fairly adequately down in our galley inside the boat. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Okay. And it's really nice to have like a, you can make ramen noodles and if you cut up green onions in there, all of a sudden it tastes like a fresh meal. Like mm -hmm. having lemon juice, having lime juice, having a few herbs. Uh, ginger and garlic we can talk about too. I like to buy the, the plastic tubes in the grocery store that have minced garlic and ginger in them already. There's probably some sort of preservative, but mainly if you took all this paper off all, and all these garlic cloves out and minced them up and made a paste, I don't know how many cloves are in that tube, but it's a lot. A lot, yeah. And you don't have to store this around. This is probably gonna get moldy, it'll get dried out, it'll get woody, and then, you know. And you can, you can get this stuff in the Bahamas. You can buy ginger and garlic almost anywhere because it stays on the shelf. But just being able to have that tube and, you know, put it in a pan, put in some oil and saute something up, especially when you're moving, when you're on the boat traveling. It's quicker. Having those quick, like, five-minute, no-measure, throw-it-together meals are really, really good. Clark has a tip for preserving ginger and garlic. What are your... What are you uh, garlic you cut up and put in olive oil and put it in your fridge, and it lasts about forever. The idea being, whatever you cook with garlic, you probably don't mind having olive oil in it. Ginger does very well if you slice it up, uh, you know, prepare it however you want to prepare it, even grind it uh, up, and put it in vodka, and then put it in the refrigerator. And um, never had it go bad in vodka. Okay, like in a mason jar or something? Yeah, yeah. And what do you do with the leftover vodka? Uh, I don't know, what would you <laughs> do with the leftover <laughs> vodka? <laughs> Have you Add had ginger sugar vodka? And call it ginger ale. <laughs> ginger ale. Oh, garbage. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's garbage. like a big deal. Like, I, that's my big question. Like, how, how to reduce the amount of garbage on your boat? Because, I mean, one port we pulled into, I remember thinking, I think it was when from Dry Tortugas. We to had like three garbage bags full under the dinghy. Because, here's why, we were in the Dry Tortugas for a week, 
We ate and, everything we had. <laughs> and we were in a very small area. We didn't want to throw composting stuff even overboard because it was a very small, you know. Our, oh, pristine area. You don't yeah, want to do anything. Yeah. Anyway, so long story short. So, so we were there for a week. The passage was a couple days there, a couple days back. So anyway, after a week and a half, two weeks, it was probably two weeks, we had three bags of garbage. And so you, you cannot, you're not allowed to put anything on the island, technically, you know. And you come into a port and you think, where am I going to dispose of my garbage? Yeah. <laughs> That's often one of the first questions that people or reduce the, the amount. come to okay. where the, do I do my, where do I put my garbage? The dry tortugas are not a good example. Because it's the United States, there's lots of crazy rules. There's too many boats jammed together. This wouldn't happen in the rest of the world. It's just because it's the only cool place, like you say, it was the high point of your trip. Right. right. You didn't go anywhere. You tried to stay in Florida for your trip. So right. you're like all those other people that don't want to actually go anywhere, and you're all jammed in the dry tortugas. It's not like that. When you go other places, if there were that many boats jammed together, you just wouldn't go there. You'd go to the next beautiful place. Mm -hmm. So they're not that tight together. There is flow. So you can the, the environment can handle the fish can eat your extra cheese you know yeah. it's not going to be the end of the world if you can eat it the fish can eat it you just chop it up into very small parts and yeah. okay. in a relatively you know fish yeah. populated like when you do your dishes area. that's going down the fish are waiting right there at the the uh, through hall eating your dishwater okay so it's all going into the water one way or the other mm -hmm. uh, whether it goes through you first or whatever it's going in the water so uh, garbage in a nutshell. First step is don't take on garbage. So when you go grocery shopping, I have a rule about cardboard. I never let cardboard from a grocery store I don't like absolutely trust come aboard my boat. I, fought, I broke the rule once, got infested with roaches. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea is roaches lay their eggs in cardboard and at the grocery store and then you brought them aboard. So we buy a bunch of groceries, we get it, put it in the dinghy, we come out to the boat, tie to the side of the boat. I open up every package, uh, label the inner package or transfer it into one of our containers, send it up, and that cardboard never leaves the dinghy. Now that cardboard sits in the dinghy until we go ashore again. If you bought groceries, there's gonna be a place for garbage. Generally, those two things go okay. together. We would go ashore to stock up on groceries in Key West because we knew it was one of the last places we could get those cheap groceries. And we had bags of garbage, and they have dumpsters out, dumpsters outside the back of the Wind Dixie, and we probably could just go there and throw them in the dumpsters. But what we did is we found somebody in the store. We left the garbage in the ding. We went to the front desk, and we said, you know, we're going to come stock up on a whole lot of groceries here. And we we are on a boat. Do you mind if we put a couple of bags of garbage in the dumpster? And the answer is always like, oh yeah, that's fine. You know, you know, we'll help you out to the ding with your groceries. They're always very helpful mm -hmm. if you ask. It's always better to. Mm -hmm. To say that, and you, they usually want to know all about your boat life and start up a conversation. But that's a good idea. Like, do your sh bring your garbage ashore, you know, dispose of it at the grocery store if you can. Like in Georgetown, there's a very specific other place you put it, mm -hmm. um, and then you know, take some of the cardboard right back after you're done grocery. Store. So I'm not going to talk about towns anymore because towns have a facility and they they have people that generate garbage. So you mm -hmm. just enter that garbage stream and it's done. Mm -hmm. That's 90% of where you're probably going to be cruising. So let's not talk about that. Let's talk about where you, there is no garbage can. So where there is no garbage can, um, your organics go overboard. Uh, the fish can eat them. The fish should eat them. Mm -hmm. You keep them around, you're going to really hate them after a while. Some chicken or whatever. And when it goes so far as we actually wash our chicken packages before we throw them away so that we keep the plastic, but we keep clean plastic in mm -hmm. our garbage. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've gone months without going to the uh, gar dumping garbage. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, you keep it. When you can't keep it anymore, uh, you can burn it. Find a nice place on the beach, uh, light a fire below the high water line at low tide. So after the fire's done, the high tide will come in and there won't be a big scorch mark and everything, you know, that kind of a deal. Burn virtually everything. Burn your tin cans because after they're burned, you've burned off the plastic preservative layers on the inside. Nice hot fire, they're gonna corrode and rust very fast. We keep our glass, and probably people will argue about this, but we keep our glass bottles and our, our glass containers and our tin cans around until we get in really deep water. And you know, if there's not gonna be a choice at the next place, we dump them over in really deep water. That's going to sink to the bottom. Make sure that they sink. Yeah, yeah, fill I don't them with water. Don't want them floating them. to a beach somewhere. <clears throat> They're going to sink, and from the wildlife point of view, that glass wine bottle is just another rock. 
except it's a rock with a little secret hidey hole on the inside that it can uh, okay. prosper in. Um, that's about it, but you know, but basically everything else burns. Yeah. Segregating garbage is important. I mean, throwing the organics overboard when you can. If you're in a well populated area, if you have like a five gallon bucket or something that you can put on the back of your boat and put it in there, kind of like your own little compost pile until you get out in deep water and oh, not okay. keep it. Like if you had a garbage can right here, sure, put like a piece of cardboard in there or an mm -hmm. empty rinse out whatever it might be but don't put you know like carrot peelings in there or the plastic from you know opening a chicken breast or something because right, it's going to start smelling really fast when yeah. it's really hot so getting that stuff kind of <coughs> segregating and segregating so that when okay. you can toss it overboard or when you can bring it in when you're going to burn garbage and you're out there talk to, talk to the other cruisers they probably have garbage too you burn it all together the fire gets hotter the plastics burn more Okay. You're going to still end up with this gob of plastic and bullfire with beer that you collect <laughs> to take with you, you because you don't want to leave the melted plastic. But the more that you have to burn, the more it will burn. Mm -hmm. And yeah. along those lines, you have to be careful that it doesn't soak into the sand and stuff. But you've likely, I mean, if you're going way out there, you've likely changed your oil. Now you want to get rid of your oil. Some people pour their used engine oil through a filter into their diesel and burn it as diesel fuel. Um, I don't do that personally. So uh, if I find a place, and I've always found a place to, to dump it in, in a city, but a lot dump of people... It, you mean dispose of it? Dispose of it, yeah. Uh, right. But uh, a lot of people burn it with their garbage. Like we had that, we, we salvaged that gas can from the wrecked boat, and it was full of really bad gasoline. Mm. And like we salvaged it, what we did is kept the gasoline from going into the environment. We ended up not keeping the gas can; we gave it away. Uh, I don't remember what mm -hmm. we did with it. But we found a big coffee. Can but it was and we full. It yeah, off. we filled it, a big old coffee can that we also found uh, with gasoline and burn it like a torch and burn all this really crappy gas you'd never want to put through your engine mm -hmm. uh, up. Uh, but burning that oil or gasoline or whatever with your garbage again, there's a lot of heat for that process. And oh, wow. You're going to burn more completely. Okay, let me ask one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talked about, the, when we were talking about the food, and you said, maybe be sure to clean out, you know, like the yeah. bag of chicken or whatever, the, the bag, you know, so you can wrap it up and it won't smell so bad or whatever. What kind of cleaning product, products do you guys recommend to use that are environmentally friendly? Do you have favorites or... We just don't use a lot, so it doesn't really matter. Oh, okay. I think I've got some, yeah. a bottle of 409 that's been on there like eight years. Oh, okay. So how much am I really dumping, right? Right, yeah, yeah. We use, I use vinegar show. a lot when I need an acid, like like your toilet, the marine toilet. The, the hoses will get all gummed up and the valves will stop working and you think you need to, to replace them and it's a miserable job. And it was for me at first, and then I remembered my like high school chemistry, mm -hmm. and I thought, what could that be? Well, it's calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate plates out of salt water when it's mixed with urine. So the whole thing gets to be a platey mess, but calcium carbonate breaks down in an acid environment. So you just put in any acid. You can use muriatic acid stuff, but you can just use vinegar, just white vinegar. You just pour some in clean the bowl with it and all the stains and everything will just come right off and that stuff by the way is really hard if you try to like scrape it with a screwdriver you'll take the porcelain off before you get the stuff okay. off but it'll come right off with acid and then you, you want to flush it into the valves and the hoses and leave it in the hoses like overnight don't use the toilet and it'll sound like alka-seltzer in there it'll be effervescent and bubbling and burping and stuff uh do that uh every few months and also make sure you flush to the point where it's only salt water in that system and everything's cleared out. And I very seriously, once I s figured that out, um, when I was in marinas and using the holding tank and not wanting to fill up the holding tank and pumping only a little bit, uh, I used the vinegar a lot. And then when we're out, we just pump it a lot so that we don't have to use the vinegar. But I went from um, 90, say 96, when I put that last toilet into Temptress, all the way until this last season, just uh, 17, 2017, okay. without changing the valves. That's 20 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so I, vinegar is I, good. I have spare vinegar valves on board, and I've never had to do that horrible <laughs> job. And it's good for food, too. Mm -hmm. we, we stock vinegar, 
we stock a little bit of bleach because there's just so much mold on a boat. Sometimes yeah. you need bleach, and obviously mm -hmm. you don't pour bleach over the side of your boat. It's bad for fish and things like that. But if you use a little bit of it in lots of mm -hmm. water, mm -hmm. um, so the concentration is low, bleach is helpful. You can use a lot of Dawn dish soap just because <coughs> it degreases. I mean, you can wash your hair with it. You can do all kinds of all kinds of stuff with Dawn dish soap, and that's really all and it's, yeah. we have. Yeah. It's kind of really all there is. There's a we detergent, a there's a chlorinating product, there's an acid product. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and then the 409 yeah. is just a convenient And <laughs> baking soda you can use to scrub things. We we'll use real scouring yeah. powder. Yeah, we have scouring powder too. But really oh, not that here's you one. Need like five bottles. Okay, this one's worth having, and we should get some more. Uh, it's called Barkeeper's Friend. It's basically scouring powder. It's Comet with an acid in it. It's really aggressive. But when something won't come up, you scrub it with Barkeeper's Friend, and it really comes up. I've heard of that. Yeah, it's very aggressive. Like, you use it on Formica long enough, you start getting pits in the Formica. But I, we had some old Formica that was always getting stained, uh -huh. and cleans right up. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I um, can't remember who it was that turned me on to it, but somebody turned me on to it here in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, he uses it on his wooden boat to scrub the unvarnished wood. And his wood just always just looks like it's freshly cut. You guys talked a lot about entertainment, the fun, the have fun part. Yeah. Tell me about Georgetown, the fun, the cruisers net. So all along going down the Exumas, you're going to meet other boats. And with the time of year you're going, November, December, you're going to meet other boats. And most of those boats are going to be going south. A lot of them are going to be going to Georgetown. So I would say whenever you see a boat, if it's there when you get there just take a dinghy right over and usually if you knock and say hey we, you know we're from such and such a place where are you guys from where are you guys heading you know Johnny. You exchange boat cards um you get to know people really easy some people aren't social and that's okay, okay. some people you know like, oh yeah come over later we'll have some wine or whatever and then you reciprocate and by the time you get to georgetown you'll know some of these right names that you hear on the radio so there's there's that social stuff to do when you um Meeting other people on boats is the best way. If you're if you're in town doing something, I mean, you can meet locals and learn about the culture, but you're probably not going to see them again. Or if you're in a touristy area doing something, you know, touristy, you're not going to uh -huh. see those people again. But boaters, it's such a small community that you, if you compared guest books or boat cards, you'd probably know some people in common. So you, you meet people very intimately. We have friends that. We're talking to on the internet, looking forward to meeting again that we've met oh, out there. Yeah. I have friends I met years ago. Uh, the people on Whisper, you know, I meet them. Uh, we yeah, make a point to get together every mm -hmm. time, even though we're going in opposite directions. Like, oh, you're going to be in Stanley Key. We'll both stop in Stanley Key and we'll have dinner together and then we'll go the other ways. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, that's basically how we met, you know, like you just help each other and then uh -huh. you, yeah. you, you, you have a relationship. Yeah. And There's this amazing karma in the sailing community. Like, if you come into a place and you meet somebody and they're having a problem with their boat, like we just instinctively help them. Or maybe we have a spare part they can have or whatever. And we may never see those people again, but we know that by doing that, we're creating this culture where they're pay helping forward. other people. It's a pay it forward culture, yeah. So like everybody gives very freely, it seems, you know, yeah. when we're down there on our boats because everybody knows that at some point you're going to be the one who, my well, boat got hit by lightning. If you need a part, you need to volunteer to pay for at least what it costs oh, to yeah. replace and people the parts. Usually, yeah, people yeah. usually barter and, and trade and sometimes, uh -huh. you know, compensate you for the parts and things. Mm -hmm. But just that help, offering right. that help or inviting complete strangers over for dinner is not an uncommon thing. Mm -hmm. As far as Georgetown goes and things to do in Georgetown, there's something for everybody. I mean, listen to the Cruiser's Net in the morning. You'll probably hear my voice. Yay! Um, <laughs> Yay. At 8 a.m. most mornings in the summer, I think we moved it to 9 after a while. But we get on there, if you've got an emergency, there's a time to talk about it. If you want to buy, sell, trade, or give away things, there's time to talk about it. If you want to organize a social event. In Georgetown, there's something for everybody. If almost every day, someone's teaching water aerobics or yoga on the beach. Uh, there's almost always a volleyball game going on at 2 o'clock on the beach. Someone's playing dominoes. Sometimes there's like an open mic thing. I like to teach like ukulele to teach lessons ukulele. Yeah, on the beach. <laughs> um, sometimes people have get-togethers and say, hey, I really want to go to... Panama. I've never been. Anybody out there who's been to Panama, let's all get together for lunch and compare notes. And you'll get, you know, 20, 30 people just coming together and talking. Oh, about how many cool. classes really on neat. how to clean the carburetor of your outboard motor have I done? Yeah. I, I, I People come over and I've had like four different dinghies 
tied to the side of temptress and I, I okay now take that part off okay oh, yeah, you're doing well okay now nope you gotta pull that bolt right the one yep yeah, okay and now we're gonna take and now we're gonna clean them and put them back together and these deans that barely made it over then they take off with full power leaving uh, <laughs> yeah everybody's, everybody's like, got happy. something to teach everybody's got something to share that's right. a pretty pretty cool place to be oh that's neat why is going to the Bahamas a good destination for first-time cruisers Okay. Uh, do you want to just talk about that? Because yeah, you've done it. Uh, I don't want to be the only font of what, wisdom. I think what you were saying earlier really applies, where you go from Florida to Bimini, and that's like a big jump, and it seems big, but then Bimini to Nassau is a little bit smaller jump. And then when you get from Nassau to the Exumas, once you get to the Exumas, you can just, you know, go two hours and then go four hours and then go, you know, maybe half a day and then skip over a few islands. But there's always, it's like if you were crossing a big deep river, there'd be kind of like all these stepping stones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's kind of how it, it's not like, oh my gosh, we have to get in the water and start sail all the way across. It's just kind of like connecting all the little dots and you can put as many dots on that map as you want. Mm -hmm. And also... The water's really clear. You can look over the side of the boat and see starfish, and you know there's you can jump in the water anywhere. It's like a big swimming pool, so it's not like yeah. uh, you're in this. Except for crossing the Gulf Stream, where the water is really deep and really blue, and your depth sounder says okay, 400 feet, 500 sailing, yeah. feet. <laughs> Especially if people who are watching, if you've got somebody who really wants to go sailing and somebody who's not quite convinced they want to go sailing, I think the Bahamas would be a great first trip for them because you've got all those stops along the way. There's grocery stores. There's you know, there's places where you can go into a marina and plug in and run your AC if you're that kind of person. Um, it's just really flexible. And Georgetown, when you get through all the exumas and you get to Georgetown, I mean, that's where it's at. There's 300, 400 boats there. People from all over the world, people from all different sailing experiences. You can compare notes, you can get together. You, it's just a really great spot. And it's mm -hmm. kind of a cool accomplishment to go through the exumas and then get to the bottom of Georgetown and a lot of people then leave from Georgetown go all other places all over the world and then they come back when we're on the net in the morning we welcome new boats mm -hmm. a lot of them are saying oh we were in Georgetown two years ago and then we went off and did all this stuff and now we're back and mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of a cool little meeting meet ground point yeah. yeah so that's why I really like the Bahamas two little things I'd like to add Georgetown has three or four hundred boats during regatta. During the peak season, yeah. And <clears throat> two or three hundred boats, but not in a bad way. It actually works. I, there's a lot of places that have two hundred boats. I wouldn't want to go. Mm -hmm. But this is this is a good community. Um, the crossing uh, across the Gulf Stream is actually technically much shorter than the crossing from Bimini to Nassau, for example, mm -hmm. or to the next place you could possibly stop. It's just that it that every step gets easier because you're going across the Gulf Stream where you could have big waves and, and big concern, and now you're gonna cross the bank where that's a big wave. Mm -hmm. So it, even though it's a longer trip, you're gonna be possibly sailing overnight. We actually just anchor on the bank. Uh, so you know, by the time we get to Nassau, we, we won't even sit, have to sail in the dark for the rest of the trip. Mm -hmm. You get to sleep, wake up in the morning, have breakfast and travel. That's nice. Thank you for watching our video. If you have any questions about cruising to the Bahamas, put them in the comments below. And as always, please subscribe. We really appreciate that.